Thank you all. An old fart like me belongs in a museum. <laughs> so I guess I can do a little bit of uh, personal reminiscing a little bit and not be too out of line and with all this great poetry. But uh, I first met Allen Ginsberg in uh, 1947. He was 19 years old, a student at Columbia, and in his small circle, he was also known then as a good poet. He had just won a prize at 19 for poetry, which gave him $300. Wow. Now, 1947, <laughs> let me tell you, that was a lot of money. <laughs> I think my dad was probably making, as a sergeant of detectives on the Denver Police Department, I think he was making 160 a month at that time. Uh, I'm just filling these young people in here on, on the economics. <laughs> uh, so I was lucky, happenstance, uh, and luck. I met Allen Ginsberg in Denver when he decided with his $300 to take his first trip west. He hadn't been uh, west of Patterson, New Jersey up to that time. Um, so I met Allen there, and later I was fortunate enough to become a good friend of Jack Kerouac's before he had published his first book was Town in the, Town in the City, long before he even thought about the new style of writing that he created for On the Road. Um, but in 1947, after spending some time in, in Denver, which is my home, uh, meeting Ginsburg there, and uh, uh, Carolyn, uh, John's mother, and uh, my buddy, uh, 20, 20 years old, uh, Neil Cassidy, uh, which was my age at the time, 20. Uh, we were just learning about the world, having our kicks, and uh, trying to become sophisticated and educated, <laughs> studying philosophy during the night, four, four, three, four and five o'clock in the morning, uh, discussing uh, the philosophers. Uh, but near the end of that summer, for reasons I don't want to go into right now, but I left Denver uh, in August of uh, 47 uh, at the request of my father, who was a detective on the police force. <laughs> I came to California uh, to work on the railroad. My uncle had was a conductor here and the chairman of the uh, union and had a little pull and got me on the railroad. I worked four months till January 48. And uh, those, those four months were hectic. I, I never laid off a day, never was off a day many times working double shifts. Anyway, I made a, I made a pile of money. And we then late, was laid off in January 48. Uh, ret returning to uh, Denver, um, and after a, a day, I ran into, who did I run into? Neil Cassidy. He is back from California for personal business in Denver, leaving Carolyn out here by herself. Neil was absolutely flat broke. He couldn't put a dime's worth of gasoline <laughs> into the automobile to head for California. He had somehow come in possession of a 1939 Packard. Oh boy, a big Packard. <laughs> Gas goes in those days. Well, I took him out and fed him. And while I was feeding him, I showed him my pay stubs <laughs> from four months on the railroad, where in some months I made twice what my dad had made in those same months. So it kind of, he kind of got big-eyed about it. And I said, well, 
I'll put the gas in, and it seemed like I was always doing that. <laughs> Whether it was a Hudson later or a Packard then, I got stuck with the gas bill. I'll put the gas in, we'll head for California. So we got out here, and in the spring, Neil was, was parking cars. I told him, look, I want you on the railroad with me. They'll be calling me back to work pretty soon. Uh, it was always very seasonal in those days. And I said, I want a buddy on the railroad. And he said, I can't quit my job parking cars because that's all the income we have. I said, okay, buddy, you got me over the barrel again. I'll guarantee what you're making now as parking cars if you will go down and take your student trips and start to work on the railroad. But I'll make up the difference until you get some good paychecks on the railroad. And that's what happened. And be, believe it or not, all you people here, Neil was a good railroad worker, a good brakeman. And until he got busted, that's another story. He, had, he did 10 years on the railroad. All very seasonal. I don't think he ever worked more than seven months, so it gave him lots of time to play. But in any case, uh, there in the latter part of 48, when we both got laid off again, we scraped up enough money between the two of us to put a down payment on a 1947, John says, I think it was a 1948, Hudson. No, it's 49. Or 49, I'm sorry. 49. You should know. Uh, uh, I'll, 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 I'll defer to him, but I thought it was like a, a late 48. Uh, you, you were there. <laughs> but uh, in those days, believe it or not, folks, automobiles did not come automatically with a heater or a radio. That was extra, extra. So we figured out how much money we had, and we put the down payment on the car, and we got a radio, <laughs> because music was important. We skipped the heater. <laughs> and when we started out on our trip, which was later chronicled by Kerouac and on the road, we start out with no heater. And we thought we would go the southern route because of the no heater. Hmm. We got to El Paso, Texas, and Neil got a hankering to see his old girlfriend, first wife, uh, Luann Henderson. Uh, so we head from El Paso directly north, way out of our way, up to Denver, and talked Luann into going to New York with us by way of North Carolina and by way of picking up Kerouac. So then we're off to, from Denver to North Carolina, leaving Denver at five degrees below zero, with no heater in the car. 